about veterans finding entrepreneurship through acquisition, it does seem to be a phenomenal alignment of skill sets and skill sets that people might not necessarily associate with the Marine Corps or the infantry or being a veteran in general. You know, and those skill sets are serving a purpose larger than yourself, being a leader, and particularly with working with people from all walks of life. And also, you know, just straight up grit and the ability to work hard. There's an entire generation of Americans who no longer care about prestige, titles, work travel, fancy offices, and lunches. Welcome to Mundane Millionaires, a podcast for this generation of small business owners who want to set their ego aside and focus on what matters, family, community, quality of life, and cash flows. In each episode, Eric Pasifici and Kevin Henderson uncover what it takes to get a little money in the bank, control your time, and invest in building great families and lives. Let's get started. Kevin, so we just had an awesome conversation with, frankly, one of my favorite people. I've only known him for about six months, so it's a little, you know, but I, but I mean sincerely, one of the best guys, he is a Marine Corps infantry officer, went to Wharton, went to McKinsey, and now he has acquired a small HVAC business in eastern Tennessee. Great conversation with John Mahoney. Yeah, fan, fantastic conversation, and, and his reputation preceded him because you've, you've known him for a while. I'd never met John. Because you, you worked with him mostly on, on his transaction and, and had met him in person in Florida at an event. And so, you know, I've, I've obviously heard all about John, but honestly, just one of the most pleasing guys to talk to. The, the audience won't know that, that we had some technical difficulties getting on. You were a few minutes delayed. So I had, you know, 10 or so minutes just to catch up one-on-one -on -one and, and get to know him since I, 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 I hadn't met him before and, and just such a you know, genuine guy, which I yeah. think, which I think is stuck with me from what, you know, you, you always talking about him is just genuinely happy, wants to help people, wants yep, to give veteran. away everything he knows to, to help veterans, you know, yep. transition into the SMB space and just a, a great conversation. Yeah. It's a great listen, especially if you're a veteran, he's building a really cool program called change of command, which is a, you know, he explains what it is in the episode, but an incredible opportunity for veterans that are looking to find ways into entrepreneurship, but generally just kind of, you know, he dishes on the business buying process, choosing a business in beautiful Eastern Appalachian, Tennessee, you know, and how he got there from South Boston. And that was just overall really, a really fun episode. So Welcome to the to the episode, everybody, and enjoy John Mahoney. So, Kevin, we we have a, a a very interesting gentleman on the pod today that I'm super excited to kind of unpack this background because I'm I'm goofing around here on LinkedIn, and you know, obviously LinkedIn's a little wonky, and it makes a year's worth of experience look like ten. But I'm trying to make sense of your background, John, because you have done a ton of really interesting things. First of all, you were a Marine Corps infantry officer for five years, which is perfect for you. I love that. Because, <laughs> well, anyways, for Eric can have to explain things. what he means by that. Yeah, we can give <laughs> that, that, that give me a lot I, of things. I think, people, I think people will understand what I mean by the end of it. Uh, and I mean it as a, as a very sincere compliment. And then you ended up at McKinsey. You did an MBA at the Wharton School of Business, McKinsey. And now you own a HVAC, I think that's the way the snob say it, not HVAC, an HVAC business in Greenville, Tennessee, very rural eastern Tennessee. So a guy, Kevin, a guy who could go anywhere, do anything, has opted to buy an, you know, a classic, enduringly profitable business in rural Tennessee. So John, with that introduction, man, tell us, a, tell us your story and, and your, give us your background. Yeah. I mean, thanks so much for having me, Eric. Ed, Kevin, you know, I can't imagine a better way to spend the afternoon than chopping it up with you legends and having a hot day here and I, the I foothills of the Smoky Mountain. <laughs> but I mean, to your point about, you know, kind of taking a winding path, it certainly has been a you know path that looking backwards, try and make it a linear path that makes sense. But at the time took many 
twists and turns that were unexpected, which was also, you know, a ton of fun and has definitely, you know, driven me to have the type of mindset of risk aversion and also trying to, you know, find meaning and purpose in what I'm doing, which led me here to East Tennessee. And like you said, you know, being a new owner to a team of amazing individuals who, you know, share common values and show up every day to work as a team and do meaningful work and serve the community. So it's been a, you know, incredible kind of next step. And a lot of that, thanks to, thanks to you both, for that simple people are getting this deal across the line as a first time buyer. And, you know, yeah, as you mentioned, grew up in Massachusetts, went to college, became a Marine Corps infantry officer in 2007 and, you know, spent the majority of my experience as a platoon commander and company commander in Afghanistan and got out in 2012 and kind of went through the difficult transition of getting back into the civilian world and trying to find my way professionally. But along the way, you know, the Marine Corps experience has been kind of foundational to both, you know, my values, my, you know, view and lens on life and leadership and, uh, you know, what I'm doing now, particularly because it's because you know, I'd like to shape both my personal and professional life in a way that I find interesting and valuable and meaningful. So, you know, that's been a, uh, a journey that's hard to believe has, you know, taken 10 years to kind of get to that point since I left the Marine Corps in 2012. So we, we were talking about this for a minute before hitting record, John, like it, neither Eric or I are, are veterans. I mean, I, you know, we, we both have people in our, you know, families and family history and whatever, but we're, we're not veterans. So there's, there's certainly not a personal thing that's leading to this. But so many of our clients are veterans, clients yeah. buying businesses. Like, un unpack that for a second. What? First of all, did you foresee yourself as you were, you know, entering the service in the Marine Corps that, like, yeah, this is a stepping stone to one day start a business? <clears throat> and if it was, or if it wasn't, like, thread that needle. Why? Why is this such an attractive thing, you know, for for veterans to be doing? Because it just it seems like so many people, especially the ones that are successful at this, finding amazing businesses, closing, just killing it with growing these small businesses, have a similar type of background with the military. Like, what? Unpack that for a, a couple of civilian lifers here. <laughs> you know, I'm glad that a lot of veterans are are finding their way to to you both, and I think a lot of that has to do with you know word of mouth because it is a very trusted community. So. You know, yeah. good people find good people definitely is a powerful tool to have, you know, after having that camaraderie of, of serving. And, you know, I think that a lot of times people join the military you know, with the specific goal in mind. Mine is really kind of about service. You know, I felt yeah. I owed a lot to this country. And, uh, you know, since we were at a time of war, I felt like that was the way that I could serve. And I definitely did not see being a business owner on the horizon. You know, I feel like, you know, people talk about imposter syndrome a lot. Yeah. I felt like an imposter in the Marine Corps where I'm surrounded by these incredible Americans, you know, and I'm trying to keep up and, and, you know, do honor to the Marine Corps. And now, you know, as a business owner, I still feel like an imposter because I don't have experience in HVAC and I'm working with a team of, you know, incredibly experienced and amazing people. But you know, to your point about veterans finding entrepreneurship through acquisition, it does seem to be a phenomenal alignment of skill sets and skill sets that people might not necessarily associate with the Marine Corps or the infantry or being a veteran in general. You know, and those skill sets are serving a purpose larger than yourself, being a leader, and particularly with working with people from all walks of life. And also, you know, just straight up grit and the ability to work hard. So, you know, the ability to assemble or disassemble a machine gun is not necessarily transferable. You know, the ability to read a map and execute on that is not as a path to an objective is not necessarily directly transferable, but that type of mindset of having a mission in mind, being able to build a team around that mission and being determined to accomplish that mission, regardless of the obstacles, I think very much encapsulate the mindset of small business owners and particularly in my case, where you're buying a business for the first time, you need to make a deep connection with that. You don't need to, but you know, in my case particularly, and I think that there's been a lot of success in finding a deep connection with that business owner who's retiring yeah. or looking to sell. And I think that being able to explain 
your military service gives you an amount of credibility, even if you lack professional credentials in that industry, that they can trust you to take care of their legacy and build their business going forward because you do have that leadership ability, which I'm finding out is leadership and communication <laughs> is much more important than my ability to have my hands on tools, which is not yeah. a part of my day since so that would be a disaster. <laughs> So that's, I guess that was giving me my question is, is this, is this closer to the Marine Corps infantry officer position or is it closer to the McKinsey associate yeah, position? Great question. What's the, what, what skill set is more valuable in your day to day? That's a, that's a fascinating question. And, and right now at this stage, so three months after the ownership transition, absolutely the Marine Corps experience. So, you know, I think you need to have both or, or having both is a phenomenal combination. But right now, if you're listening I'm to not, this out there, you need to have gone to the Marine Corps and McKinsey in order to buy and operate a small business. Is what John is trying. <laughs> that is not the message. So, that, so there's three of you. That, you know, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, John. Please continue. I mean, you know, having having the ability to have that strategic and analytic mindset, you know, going forward from a McKinsey type lens is obviously uh, you know, something that's important to me and something I think that I bring to the table and hope will make me successful. But right now, you know, this is about building relationships with people who are actually making this business move forward. So yeah. building a bond with the retiring owner, building a business who's built a business over 30 years. So the idea of me coming in here and saying, Hey, you know, I have this skill set as a associate consultant post MBA, you know, let's move forward with just that, you know, would be, I think, incredibly short sighted. So, you know, being able to be a team, you know, motivate team, learn both from, you know, current members and think about growth for future members of the team. I think that the Marine Corps really encapsulates a lot of those experience where, you know, you have a hard mission, you know, there's a lot of moving pieces and how do you have the ability to empower people to execute and make decisions on their own? Because especially as a new owner where I don't have I mean, you know, a deep knowledge of the industry. I need to be able to trust this team and they need to be able to trust me, which is probably how we've spent the most time over these last 12 weeks is building that trust and that relationship where we feel like a unit and feel like this family business is, is continuing with that attitude of doing what's right for the team so that we can do what's right for our customers. Yeah, I love, I love that. And I, and I want to circle back, just piggybacking off that to something else you said that like, really perked my ears up. And that's about this like idea of imposter syndrome. Cause like, if you look back at your background, right. And we've talked about the Marine Corps and how that's translatable and whatever, but like, and I don't want to like do the resume dump here, but yeah. What I mean, are you, you got, worried about John? Like that's my, that, I think that's where Kevin's well, that, going. That's, that's where I'm you, going. Right. You like, have imposter well, syndrome, like for, you know, well, you? I, but I, but I think before you answer that, John, I, I think this is twofold, right? Because on the one hand, there are other people out there who are incredible people and have done amazing things and have that Wharton background and, and, you know, McKinsey or Goldman or whatever that are like, okay, yeah, like someone else that struggles with the same idea of imposter syndrome, but there's the flip side of it as well. Right. There's, there's the person that graduated from state school and has spent 20 years, like, you know, clawing their way yeah. to mid-level management. That's, that's like, dude, if like this guy with like Harvard and Wharton on his resume, Marine Corps officer and McKinsey, feels like an imposter. Like I don't stand a chance out there. Right. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of twofold. Like how, how do you, how do you respond to both of those people? Or how do you, how do you think about overcoming this idea of imposter syndrome, whether it's like, you probably shouldn't have it because you've got incredible experience, or if you feel like you don't have incredible experience here, here's how you can overcome it. Well, I mean, th thank you for saying that. It's very kind of you, especially coming from the both of you, you know, talk about like, uh, you know, resumes and, well, and that's, impressive and that's part of why, And that's part of why I asked not to cut, sorry to cut you off, John, but like, cause I struggle with the same thing. I, you know, I'm relatively well-educated, successful background in law firms and things like that, but I struggle that, that same thing coming, you know, working with other lawyers, like, oh, this person knows more than me, like second guessing myself on an answer, like, you know, 
is that right? I should probably do a little more research. So, I mean, it's coming from a very, like a, a very personal, like, man, cause you've got, you've got an incredible background. You seem like the person that shouldn't feel like an imposter. Maybe I'm, I'm in the exact same boat, but I, I struggle with that same issue daily. Well, I gotta say, you know, I obviously don't wish that on anybody, but it does give me a level <laughs> of comfort to hear that, you know, and here I'm also going through that and, you know, I mean, two, things, well, I guess three things come to mind. You know, one is, you know, the Marine Corps is kind of famous for irrational confidence where, you know, in the face of any <laughs> obstacle we will overcome. And, you know, I try and bring that certainly. And, uh, you know, imposter syndrome definitely has not dampened my enthusiasm or my ability to just hammer, but it definitely adds a level of tension. Yeah. And, you know, to, to, to your point about researching, Two people said very interesting things along those lines to me. One was about Parkinson's law, where basically, you know, the amount of work you have will fill up the time you give it. So if you set a deadline for a year, it'll take you a year. If you set a week, it'll take you a week. And that's something I really struggled with going into a new domain of, of you know, searching for a business, leading a business for the first time is, you know, how do I screen all of this information, to find the actual trusted search sources that are worthwhile? And then move forward because I certainly got into the mode of, I'm just going to digest information, digest information and figuring out when is the time to put the switch and get action is very yeah. difficult. And I certainly felt a lot of anxiety over, well, I don't know enough, so I need to learn more, but also feeling anxiety over, well, I'm not taking action, which is what I know I'm supposed to do. So that's been an interesting dynamic to try and figure out. And I think I'm getting better at it in terms of, you know, Six months ago, I subscribed to every newsletter and every, yeah. you know, source of information. And now I'm seeing, okay, well, that one was kind of a introductory course and, you know, I've kind of moved past that now so I can, you know, shut that off that email inbox. And the other, the other principle was the Peter principle about promoting yourself to, or getting promoted to a point of incompetence where mm. sometimes, you know, you get, yeah. you know, pushed forward because you're a great contributor at an individual level to be a team leader, but maybe you're not prepared for that. And so I've been thinking about that myself, especially paired with the irrational confidences. Am I so risk averse that I'm putting myself in a position where I'm not competent and, you know, moving forward in these uncomfortable situations of kind of unknown circumstances was very familiar to me from the Marine Corps, but still, still feel uncomfortable. So yeah. You know, it's definitely been, you know, to your point about kind of like pairing these different experiences over the past years, it's a constant, it's a constant battle to kind of like take a second and reflect on that and be like, all right, yeah. well, you know, I don't know right now, but I will, I'll figure it out. A lot of people have figured it out before me and, you know, there's a great support network, particularly of other veterans who have done this before me and laid the bath and can call them when I get, you know, hung up or confused and. You know, it's, it's, yeah, it's definitely, you know, you two know better than most that this is a great community to be a part of. So even though yeah, there is a lot sure. of uncertainty, there's a lot of people to lean on and a lot of camaraderie. Yeah. Eric, I, I may, I may regret asking this. Do, do you, I mean, I'm just, I'm just curious. Like, do you struggle with the same thing? Do you ever have this idea of like, man, everyone out there is just killing it or way smarter than I am? The imposter syndrome? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, no question, right? Like I, my last law firm, you know, I would argue that those are the best M&A professionals save for like, you know, a handful of other firms like on the planet, right? Like they're out of this world with w what they know. And, you know, when I was with them, it was like head constantly spinning. Right. And I totally. think that like a lot of professionals can relate to that white collar professionals that go to the McKinsey's and the Goldman's and you know, and the, 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 the Kirkland's that like, you do get your ass kicked intellectually for, you know, however many years you're there and then you come out of it and you don't even know how much, you know, right? Like you don't even realize how much distance you've put between yourself and the average person. But then, you know, you kind of the Peter's principle thing tied in, yeah. you also get to that point in life where you've leveled up, level, level, level up. And then you go, wait a second actually nobody knows what they're doing and we're all just kind of you know <laughs> like the girdly thing he tweeted yesterday about you realize nobody knows what the hell's going on um and i think that's true right like we're all making get hired by a company you know we're running a business now right you view that from the outside and it looks very two-dimensional you know a very sturdy ship 
and then you're on the inside and you realize it's actually very dynamic. And it, I think that that's why in the business buying community, there's so much conversation from experienced folks when they're communicating to either inexperienced folks or people who are pushing an over glamorized image, particularly, I love the, you know, call it M and a porn. I love putting the, the, you know, the screenshot of the, you know, the Hawaii HVAC business with, a two X multiple and going yeah. like, wouldn't you love to make 1.3 million bucks and live in beautiful Lahaina Maui? And it gets a lot of engagement, right? But then you got a lot of experienced folks that are like, that business is probably a nightmare on the inside. And so, you know, a lot of imposter syndrome, but also I think like imposter syndrome morphs, I think into a, re a realization that life is really messy and hard and ever changing and just it's just difficult so yeah not kevin, yeah that's though. for sure kevin is steady eddie kevin's good at everything john this guy is legitimately like, good at literally everything They're no i'm like he's i'm like, like the personified he's winning the, he's winning the karaoke contest on the cruise ship You're like what <laughs> just, what else can you do he's, I, I did. He, it's true i was a finalist in the voice of the ocean on princess cruise line it's it's a true it's a true the story. voice of the ocean well what was your so, song or did you uh, have my audition song was chicken fried Zach Brown band. And that's what got me to the finals. And then finals was sweet Caroline. Cause I'm not a good, I'm not a good singer, right? We happened to have a big group on the ship that like went all in on a friend of mine and I, and so I was like the, the only thing that's going to keep me from getting embarrassed and booed off the stage is to do a crowd pleaser. That, right. Right. And like, <laughs> who doesn't like start shouting at the top of their lungs when they're three cocktails in to sweet Caroline. Right. So it, Kevin's a it was a very strategic decision. You had, you had other out. people, you had other people doing like Celine Dion and like breaking out their like opera skills. And I was like, what, what are we, come on, you know, we're on a, we're on a cruise ship. I'm three cocktails in about to perform on stage. It's, uh, Last little, time I took a cruise, diamond. it was Christmas time, and there was it was like something from a sitcom, dude. There was this one man singing "White Christmas," and every so often you'd be walking through this room or that room, and there he is singing "White Christmas." And then the next day you're walking through, this, and there he is singing. And this deep, you know, I'm dreaming. Of oh, please one. stop! Please I'm stop, Eric. Sorry, I'm killing it, but you know, what I'm <laughs> it was something I'll never forget. Anyways, so. We need to edit that out, by the way. No, there's, absolutely. There's not. zero That's chance beautiful. for editing that out. Change, That's change of command. So, John, so this is bigger than Bailey's, though, right? Bailey's being the business you bought three months ago. This is about building something for veterans to give them an on ramp to entrepreneurship through what you're calling change of command. Tell us about change of command. Yeah, so, you know, as part of this winding path after consulting, helping to build a political organization, I knew I wanted to get back to the private sector specifically with entrepreneurship, but wasn't sure what. So I ended up using the GI Bill. So thank you for your spare dollars to do this one year master's program at the heart. And, you know, while, while I was there trying to figure out my next steps, the pandemic kicked off and yeah. I was trying to find a way to be helpful. So I volunteered for the small business administration and that was where i first learned about the uh, retiring baby boomer business wave and also how many vietnam era veterans are part of that cohort so vietnam era veterans are pretty heavily overrepresented as business owners and i started change of command essentially as a exit planning type advisor to help them think through selling their business maximize the sale price get their personal wealth in order get their minds right and along the way, they had a lot of the same comments of, hey, this is fantastic advice. Thank you so much. But you're talking about jobs. You're talking about growing these businesses for the long term. You need to be actually on the buy side so that you can accomplish these goals. And I took that advice to heart. And last summer, basically flipped the model to build change of command to partner with retiring owners to transition ownership as Part of the goal being a long-term holding company, particularly with veterans being members of that holding company and being the operating partners with the idea of, of growing these businesses over the long term. So the idea is to, you know, not only grow companies, but strengthen these communities. So as you mentioned, you know, three months ago, bought Bailey's Heating and Air in Greenville, Tennessee, about an hour and a half outside of Knoxville, you know, in the Smoky Mountains, in Appalachia. 
and am running it myself because I think that that's an incredible opportunity. I've learned a ton over the past three months, I think is an invaluable experience, but over the long term, the idea is through a partnership model and thinking about how to make these transition ownerships a win for everybody and get a lot of veterans the opportunity to run and own businesses, especially as we're seeing this, you know, massive transition that you guys talk about often. And like we said, I think veterans are the perfect people for this opportunity, whether they have industry experience or not. I think that those values and those leadership abilities and the ability to work hard will win the day for, you know, many veterans who want to get into this space. So what, it, what does that structure look like, John, if, if you don't mind sharing, I mean, you know, share as, as much or as little as you want, but what, so what's the actual structure here? A, a, a veteran, they're, they're transitioning out of the service or they've been out of the service. They're interested in being a small business entrepreneur and they come and talk to you. What does that look like? Ch change in command is buying a business and then allowing that veteran to be the operator and kind of vest into some ownership or change in command partners with the, the selling business to kind of transition the exiting owner to the veteran. Like what, how, how does it actually work in practice? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, still of course in the early innings and, sure. you know, to our conversation earlier about getting action and moving forward, you know, I think that a mistake I had made and to see a lot of people getting bogged down and kind of like creating these very long-term structural decisions early, <laughs> maybe, you know, unnecessarily early. But for the meantime, you know, the idea right now is to be helpful to as many veterans as possible who are wanting to buy a business, particularly to what we were talking about earlier, you know, share resources, sharing introductions, sharing knowledge, yeah. and making sure that any veteran who wants to get into this at least has the information and the resources to make a decision and, and successfully execute on it if they choose to pursue that. In the long term, to your point, something that we're trying to take the spirit of the exit planning partnership where I was on the sell side is to pair that owner over the long term, particularly in partnership with a veteran who can operate that after a transition of ownership to make sure that, you know, the owner is getting the, the win that they deserve after building a business for so long. The business is not only stabilized, but prepped for growth over the long term and that veteran can step into the business basically as a partner, as opposed to showing up brand new and, and taking the reins of no support. So yeah. the idea would be to facilitate, you know, the continuation of these legacies that company, particularly in rural areas have built and, uh, you know, make it a great way for a veteran to not only run a business, but like you said, you know, have partial ownership and and be compensated, you know, commensurate with their efforts, which is something that the military does not have, which, yeah. you know, is a kind of new experience for a lot of transitioning vets. Well, I think it's such an important factor, right? And we talk about this all the time that, you know, if you're, if you're collecting a paycheck, you're a, you're a stakeholder to an extent, but at the end of the day, you don't have the key decision-making authority, right? You're not, you're not a, you're not a true stakeholder. And I, th and I think you're right. I, I mean, that's gotta be a, a difficult mental transition to make coming out of the service where, where everything is about sort of the greater good, you know, the, the, the nation and, and what you're defending and start to bridge that into how can I adapt that skill set, but into something that builds a legacy for, for, for me and my family, you know, and that, that really comes with, with meaningful equity ownership. I mean, that's just the, that's just the reality. You know, we, we talked to Chris Munn who, who walked us through the story of his dad. I, Eric, keep me honest here. I, I don't remember what it was three or four decades or something like that with a large corporation as an employee and laid off, you know, right before retirement. And it's like, uh, yeah. you know, at the, at the end of the day, it's that meaningful equity. That's what's, what's going to build that financial legacy. You know, now Chris's dad, le you know, had, has a lot of other legacy and, and it's not to downplay any of that, but I, I think it's super, super important and, and a, a great service to that community as they're sort of bridging that next phase. Cause I, I, I have to imagine you're right. That transition back to civilian life's just got to be a, a kind of a, a bandaid rip. That, that be yeah. And you know, it's funny, the, the, the change of command, the name obviously comes from the, you know, military handoff from a, you know, a commander who's 
introducing the the future commander to the unit and he's taking leadership of that unit and you know it's a very ceremonial occasion you know oftentimes there's like a big celebration involved for the outgoing commander but one of the interesting differences between the military and now is that if you're a new leader of the unit you can count on your whole team still being there so whether you're the best leader or the worst leader that unit is going to remain intact because people can't really quit. Oh, to your point, you know, people will do what they're incentivized to do in the private sector. So, you know, particularly through compensation and a lot of their other goals. So, you know, as a military transitioning to the civilian world, the idea that you get to negotiate your pay, you get to, you know, be compensated (laughs) for the level of effort. You never never negotiated your promotions, John? (laughs) Is that not, that's not a thing? I hear what you're saying, sir, but. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, you you hate to hear stories like that about people who spent decades uh, loyal service to a company and then not reap the rewards. It's brutal. But yeah, I mean, and you know, it's, it's certainly a change of change of scope as well for a lot of people who are moving from the military to the civilian world where you know, oftentimes the, the compensation might be less of a consideration as, you know, I used to be a team leader. I used to be in charge of a squad of people and now I'm an individual contributor. Can't wait to get up the ladder again so that I can, you know, take that leadership again and, you know, mix in the idea that compensation is a part of that equation as you're going up and, you know, you're taking care of your family without the military structure. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a big transition for sure. To your point about the Band-Aid piece, I think that there's a lot of great organizations that try and help with that, but still got to be a difficult move no matter no matter how many you know, organizations are dedicated to it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I get that. So I, I feel like we've talked a lot about the military. We haven't talked a lot about McKinsey. You know, wa- <laughs> wa- walk us through your, your experience Tell at McKinsey. Tell us about McKinsey. <laughs> what? Give us Be the mindful dirt, of the fact we're going to edit all this out. So Don't please. hold back. <laughs> well, you know, I can't remember what book it was, but, you know, the book jacket said something about how it was like the Jesuits, the Marine Corps, and McKinsey. You know, they all kind of are cut from the same cloth. And okay. I went to an all guys Catholic Jesuit high school. I okay. went in the Marine Corps. So, like, all right, naturally. McKinsey seems like a. Why you're so happy, John? You're just like, you're glad to be out. You know, you're glad that it's, it's over. Is that because you see, you are probably one of the happiest people I've ever worked with. I mean, I mean that as a compliment. Well, I'll, I'll definitely take that as a compliment. Thank you for saying that. I mean, you know, it is a little bit jarring sometimes when people find out I was in the Marine Corps and I was in the infantry because a lot of people kind of think of a drill instructor stereotype. And that yeah. definitely not describe me, which did get me in trouble when I was around drill instructors for sure. But the, you know, I had a wonderful experience at McKinsey. You know, I did a summer internship there between MBA years. I had a interesting transition from my MBA to McKinsey where I basically asked, you know, Hey, how long can I push back my start date? Because I was just kind of interested in using that time for something maybe entrepreneurial or just interesting and ended up working in education in Africa. So I'm very, which was one of the most yeah, you know, unbelievable experience in my life. So I'm, I'm very grateful to McKinsey for that opportunity. And I think that to your point about, you know, you can come from any path and be successful as a business owner, but being able to have that experience at McKinsey, I think has really enhanced my ability, especially to think strategically because no one's, no one's coming to help you in that regard, right. you know, so right now. You know, um, I'm not having anybody here who can, you know, build slide decks of more importantly of the strategy that would get put on the slide deck. So, you know, having seen what an organization that's been dedicated to that for a decade and, you know, invest a ton of resources in their team to be able to, you know, provide that type of service. I'm still grateful for having had that opportunity because I think we can all, you know, agree that like sitting in an MBA class is one thing, you know, this is like crawl, walk, run kind of type of learning where, you know, you're sitting in classroom, you're absorbing the academics of it in a vacuum. And that's kind of like the crawl. And then, you know, you get an internship and that's the walk. And then you move on to the run, which was, you know, my actual experience post MBA at McKinsey, but then definitely in entrepreneurship. 
So having that kind of foundational experience to build on as I transition out of the military, I'm, I'm very grateful to, to McKinsey, you know, for that experience. And no, honestly, great. you know, I would have stayed longer, but just had a really unique opportunity to help build a political organization that supported military veterans. So, you know, having okay. that type of mission was just so appealing, especially to work with the founders an incredible individual Marine vet, you know, it just had to really think hard about it and really, you know, admit that I was very risk tolerant because that was a big jump, but yeah, I'm sure, you know, it was a great experience and made a lot of friends and a lot of great relationships. there. wonderful, wonderful people too. Let me ask you about the business, the business buying experience though, John, take us through when you caught the bug, how long the process took and then how you, one of the most interesting things about you to me is that you ended up in Greenville, Tennessee, right? Probably beautiful, never been there. Love Gatlinburg, love Tennessee generally, but how you cho- like, how did you choose Greenville, Tennessee? I'd love to hear that story. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, speaking of kind of the NBA experience and being in consulting, when I was an NBA, I'd heard of this term search. You know, Wharton now has a pretty advanced program. There's a lot of other NBAs that are, you know, also leaders in yeah. search, both kind of traditional and, and self-funded search, but at the time, I kind of wrote it off. I didn't really explore the resources that were available at the time because I just didn't have the confidence that that was for me. You know, I thought I had to go get industry experience. I thought I had to go to this, you know, kind of like blue chip firm to, to, you know, move forward and maybe entrepreneurship would be a path down the line. So only after my MBA program, when I actually had peers who had done search right away or heard through the grapevine about amazing veterans who had done this that, you know, I, I really started to think about it, but, you know, with the change in command model, I really enjoyed advising owners, but with their advice, I really made the decision that, okay, what, what is most important to me going forward in my life is ownership and having the ability to control my destiny, you know, to make these kind of life choices, how I choose to spend my time and energy and attention, you know, have that totally on me. And, you know, when it came to Greenville, Tennessee, instead of being in Appalachia and East Tennessee, you know, I'm originally from the South shore of Boston. So I am definitely a Yankee you fit right transplant. In? Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> no, but how, what was your search process? John? How did you find Bailey's like what, take us through the search. So. I had a pretty non-traditional experience where I hadn't been that long into the actual search. I was kind of doing everything that, you know, all the books, all the, you know, resources recommend, you know, reaching out to brokers, you know, kind of getting some experience, looking at Sims, uh, you know, talking to yeah. business owners by reaching directly out to them. And I was, you know, extremely transparent about change of command's goals. You know, I, I am a first time business buyer. I have this goal of envision of building change of command. I'm a Marine Corps veteran. I know I don't have experience in a lot of these industries, but I'm eager to learn and there's no doubt I'm going to work hard. And along the way, telling brokers this, one of the brokers reached out to me a few weeks after we'd had a discussion and said, Hey, there's a heating and air conditioning business that I represented in the past. They actually didn't sell, took it off the market because they couldn't find anyone that they felt shared their values and would continue their legacy. And that was their number one priority. And, you know, I certainly know that, you know, that's kind of a niche in the market. You know, there's yeah. the pr- predominant majority of the marketplace is kind of looking for, you know, the ability to close at a price that best suits them. So, you know, definitely came out here, got razzed a little bit about being a transplant to the great state of Tennessee <laughs> and, uh, you know, we really hit it up and continue the conversation. And, you know, I absolutely made my case that, you know, I want Bailey name to outlive me. And, you know, I think that this is incredible business that was built by an amazing person who, you know, is essentially like a godparent to me at this point. But, you know, him and his wife and I. With you right, right now? Yeah, I didn't know. He's <laughs> <laughs> not thin walls, you know. He's I just, holding up the cue cards. Godfather, please. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, unfortunately, I have what people call an Irish whisper where I cannot control the volume of my voice, especially when I'm on a Zoom call or 
extreme as an extremely loud human being too. I I appreciate the <laughs> eloquence of the Irish whisper there. <laughs> I mean, technically, I'm in an office room with four walls, but I'm sure everyone in the building can hear me. Hey, wow. we've grown. We have made hires. Yeah, you know, some fantastic. some were also transplants. We're still hiring. And, so you're, three, uh, you're three months in. Is that right? I have that right. Yeah, three months almost to the day. Yep. What's been the hardest? What's been the most surprising and difficult part of it? Give us. The, I know people are listening. Give us the give us the real answer. <laughs> Don't be like how much I love the people of Greenville. And yeah, I mean, I, I definitely do love the people of Greenville and I live right across the street from the business. So, you know, it makes yeah, it easy right. to be present and around. But, uh, you know, I think that I think that when people talk about some of these best practices for how to have a, a day full of productivity, you know, deep work, time blocking, Tomodoro method, you know, all, you know, to your point about like Twitter on M&A and everything else, you know, there's all these kind of like productivity type. I think that the most surprising thing to me is just the, which shouldn't be surprising because everyone said it, but to actually see it in person, live and breathe it, just the constant, you know, drip and ebbs and flows of, hey, you got to take this phone call right now. Hey, you got to yep. answer this yeah. customer yep. right now. Hey, you got to run yep. this part, you know, oh, you need to go buy a pair of windshield wipers, you know, so it's like, you know, no task too big, no task too small right now, which is fine because that's, you know, kind of part of the deal and not to get too Marine Corps centric, but the Marine Corps, part of their war fighting philosophy is about tempo. So it's not your absolute speed. It's about relative speed. So sometimes you really need to move fast. Other times you need to move slow. So, you know, the, the past three months have been an exercise in tempo of, you know, hey, right now I really want to move fast on, you know, implementing some technology changes. But yeah. I actually need to move slow on that. And what I need to move fast on is building trust with the team creating a structure where these amazing technical experts can thrive and do their job. And then I can worry about kind of like the, you know, big picture, you know, CRM type stuff later because everything's going fine and it has gone fine for 30 years. So I'm here to like not break anything or not, not try to fix anything that's not broken. So, yeah. you know, that's been kind of like the, uh, a revelatory experience of what business owner's day is like, particularly in home services, particularly in HVAC, right as uh, areas getting hot for the summer is that, you know, sometimes your time's not your own, even though, you know, yeah. you, you want it to be, and maybe that's at a higher level why I got into this, but it's, uh, yeah, it's been a great, great way to put myself through the paces, especially with the larger vision, you know, cause it would be difficult to truly understand what a new owner, new operating partner is going through without actually having lived and breathed it. Well, I'll beat Kevin to it and by saying that that resonates deeply with us. You know, the death by a thousand cuts and the, you know, you're, you know, and I don't know how much you're selling to John, if you're out there actually trying to, you know, sell project based work and run a business and make sure payroll gets cut and everything else. I mean, it's, it's a lot. I think that's one of the things that people are, are subtly saying when they say entrepreneurship is you know, very challenging. It's, you know, it's got all the wonderful, like life fulfilling elements that like makes you feel cozy and like, Hey, I'm doing something of great meaning and I want to keep doing this, but the actual day to day is quite challenging. Any, any things in, in your sale that were different than what was represented, any red flags, anything that popped up, you know, that we didn't catch when we did diligence. <laughs> Boy, I mean, <laughs> If you didn't catch anything, then, you know, they would have been masters of birds. I No, everything has been, and I think that goes back to the, the value-based relationship and just, you know, the people talk about, you know, what it takes to be successful. You know, Eric, I know that you've posted many times kind of a list, you know, it's like conservative underwriting, you know, work with a great a lawyer, <laughs> which I highly recommend, you know, have a good lending partner. Yep. Quality I think that earnings. sometimes it's, yeah, I mean, I think sometimes having a great person as the selling owner yeah, doesn't yep. make it a list or maybe is it top of the list. It's, it's high on my list. It's high on my list, John. <laughs> and the push, no, the pushback I always get when I say buy a good business from a good person is how do you know if they're a good person, yeah. right? And the response is you'll know. You'll know if they're a good person. By the end of the, you know, a 90-day negotiation process, you'll you'll know. Yeah, um, I mean, the, I, 
I think I think the answer nobody wants to hear is those very marginal cases of like out and out fraud. Like, there's no way anyone could have known. Sure. Right. But in 99% of the cases, you're you're going to figure it out. I, I yeah. agree with that, Eric. And there are some deals where you close them, and you know, you I have literally said the words out loud to clients that if this goes badly, well, can't say we didn't see it coming. You know, and that doesn't mean that it's going to go badly, right? Like, but sometimes you just, you, you know who you're dealing with. Now, just because the person isn't, you know, the Brady, you're not buying from, you know, Forrest Gump or enter, you know, you know, earnestly nice person. Doesn't mean it's not a great business. Doesn't mean it's not a great acquisition. It's just you're, you're, the, the between the line stuff, you know, is you're going to find out some things that maybe you weren't expecting, but not always. Um, you never know. Yeah, I mean, uh, and now those Roberts are tired of just poked his head in. So, you know, maybe you hear me. Uh, <laughs> <Nah>. <laughs> but, I mean, to, to your point, you know, I, I feel incredibly fortunate that, you know, I found great people who are in a great business, great yeah. community. So the idea of that working out, you know, I feel like the stars aligned. And obviously, you know, definitely you guys – probably see this all the time you know there's an aspect to this like a numbers game you know it wasn't like this was like one of one you know this was like a lot of filtering and you know finally got to the right point but you know to your point about greenville and why the tennessee you know it's an amazing community it's a growing community you know it used to be very rural now it's suburbanizing and my priority was to buy an amazing business from a fantastic owner that could grow so, you know, in my own kind of rank ordering of life priorities, you know, I was kind of location agnostic. I wanted to stay in the state of Tennessee because I think that, you know, change commands focus right now is on Tennessee based companies, especially because of some public private public private partnership opportunities, because this is very important to communities to make sure that these transitions go well. So, you know, being here in Greenville has been amazing to kind of like see the energy around this you know, so far success story of a successful transition because that's yeah. a big deal. This is a community where, you know, Bailey Heating and Air has a phenomenal name in the community and it's been the pillars of the community for 30 years. So the idea that, you know, this can successfully happen here is, is very powerful. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, how big is the vision, John, for you personally? Are you going to, I know you, I saw your, I popped into Michael Gurley's Hold Co. course. This is not an endorsement for Michael Gurley's Hold Co. course. Uh, it's, not, <laughs> it's not, not an endorsement either, but you know what I mean? Uh, uh, I popped, I popped in, I saw you in the room and I thought I, there's, you know, there was everybody in your, your face. I was like, John, what's, what's the ambition? What are you trying to, what are you trying to build personally? Well, you know, to the idea of, um, there being horizons here and doing, you know, work that you think is meaningful. I mean, the goal for me, you know, to get a little deep here, I'm totally, you know, stealing this from other people I've heard, but like, what's the meaning of life? The meaning of life is to create meaning for yourself. And two of the primary ways you can do that is by solving problems and building relationships with people. So, you know, I actually feel like I am very much doing that right now with Bailey. So, you know, I am so excited that this has all come to fruition, but I think that there's a world where, you know, change of command can do that for a lot of communities. I think that so many communities in both Tennessee and America need this. I think that, you know, veterans both will succeed at this and it's a great opportunity. You know, Kevin, you mentioned building personal wealth. I think that this is an amazing opportunity. So the vision really becomes how do we build change of command to be the acquirer of choice of retiring business owners in Tennessee so that we can keep these communities thriving. And, you know, whether that happens in the near term or the long term, I truly feel like I found exactly what I want to be doing in my life. So that's okay because my time horizon is forever, you know, so I can think about it in those terms then. You know, whether a deal takes, you know, the 90 day closing window or the, the kind of like six month closing window, it's all right because, you know, there, there is a long term vision here. So that was a long winded answer to your question, Eric. 
No, it's a great answer. It's a great answer. And, you know, it's a very compelling vision. So, you know, it's no, it's yeah. no surprise that it resonated so quickly with Bailey's and I'm sure that it will many others. It's funny because, Kevin, I don't know if you know this or not, but John and I met at the boot camp, the business buying boot camp. I gave you a ride over to the Mexican restaurant that night. He's pitching. You were pitching change of command to, I can't remember the other gentleman that we were with, but he, he was locked in, man. He was like, that is such a, you have such a powerful vision. And he was just like, I don't know. You could just see he was dripping with envy because he wanted to buy a business, but you know, he could tell that you had this like very, you'd yeah. caught magic in a bottle with your idea. And then to see you go and acquire a business, like no joke, like that was within what a couple months of that first meeting. And then now here we are. So excited to see where this all goes. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, that was a great car ride. That was, a, that was an amazing experience. And, you know, part of this is about celebrating, you know, just, you know, we had a, a long day of discussions and get into some like deep M&A tactics. And then we all went out and had a great time. I mean, yeah. you know, part of this is about celebrating what these retiring owners have built, celebrating new leaders stepping into opportunities. And, you know, part of the change of command model is to bring attention to this. So, you know, this fall, once we're through the kind of busy summer heat, we're going to have an actual change of command ceremony. You know, we'll, we'll get the whole community out and really celebrate everything that Robert's built for, for, over the last for, 30 for years. Bailey. Oh, awesome. Yes. Oh, so you guys will awesome. have a VIP invite. To, yeah. Uh, I'm going to be at a, my Mountains brother's sure. bachelor party in, Ga in Gatlinburg in July. So, you know, if you're thinking, if you're choosing well, months. So schedule you know. it around Eric's. I said you have to do it in July. That's what I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> um, so, we'll get you on a return trip, you know, we'll get you on yeah, a return trip. for sure. For sure. <laughs> John, you want to plug the website or anything else you want to plug before we wrap? Yeah. I mean, I, I would just plug that, uh, you know, obviously hugely supportive of the whole entrepreneurship through acquisition community, but particularly if you're a military veteran thinking about going down this path, regardless of kind of where you're at, you know, reach out. I'm easy to find LinkedIn, probably the best way, John Mahoney, M-A-H-O-N-Y and you know, would love to be helpful and, uh, you know, point people in the direction of great resources, including you both. I mean, couldn't say, you know, could, it's hard to say how thankful I am to you both for all the resources and everything else. I mean, talk about uh, accelerating the process and getting people across the line who, you know, are entering the fray as first time entrepreneurs and being able to, you know, rely on trusted partners is, is uh, so key to the whole process. So appreciate you both. And uh, love, uh, love getting to catch up, you know, outside of specific deal terms and, For sure. and reviewing documents. So this is amazing. Yeah. Well, the, pl the pleasure was all, all ours, John. It was awesome to work with you and everybody. I, I don't know if you know this or not, but everybody was falling all over themselves to help. Like even the title company, when I told them the story, they were like, we'll do this for free, you know? So very cool and great to, great to chat with you today. Thank you, Bill. Thanks, John. Thanks for listening to this episode of Mundane Millionaires. If you enjoyed what you heard in this episode, make sure to follow Mundane Millionaires wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. See you next time.